We acknowledge that we are situated on and recording from the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe in what is now called Ontario. We recognize that Maud comes from a land she referred to as Prince Edward Island, but the indigenous people of the area, the Mi'kmaq, call it Ebigwit. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are commentary on the life, times, and works of Lucy Maud Montgomery and are solely those of the podcast authors, their guests, or those participating in the podcast and do not represent those of the heirs of Ellen Montgomery. Hello there and welcome back to Maud Books, Babes and Barbiturates, Episode 3, The Most Vital Subject in the World. When we first started reading Maud's journals, one of the biggest shocks to us was how boy crazy she was. We loved it. Probably too much, but we were stupidly surprised. Was it those puffy sleeves and the high collars that made us think that people didn't have sex? I don't know. In Ella Montgomery novels, sexuality was hidden. As we covered in our last episode, Maud believed if she wrote what girls were truly thinking, she would never be published. There was the exception of The Blue Castle, which was still very tame, but wild enough to be banned from some church libraries. So, Maud wrote sparingly about sexuality, but was she sexual? Or high-spirited, as she was remembered in Cavendish? These journals were a surprise. Her self-proclaimed year of wild passion with Herman Leard, leading on random dudes in carriages, mostly for rides, secret engagements. Frankly, the way she writes in her first two volumes, it's super passionate. Look out, Lizzo. Maud needs your wind machine. We also looked at this part of Maud's life not as a segment separated from the whole, but as a significant and telling piece of Maud. We see an abandoned little girl who seeks male approval any way she can get it. Was Maud seeking the attention and approval from men that she never got from her absentee father and emotionally distant grandfather? Hmm. Unhook that bodice. You look great, but can you breathe? And light that cigarello as we present the most vital subject in the world. Young women during the Victorian era were not taught about sex or their bodies. There were obscenity laws, so sex was viewed dangerously, unless you were married and making babies. As there were deep moral issues connected to female sexuality, women were constantly held in check and kept in the dark. These were the confines Maud was raised within. When we say it was another time, it really was another time. And by the time she was 15, Maud was pretty. She was a clothes horse, smart, witty, and hip. She was a catch, and she knew it. There were instances of Gilbert Blythe-level courtships both on the island and in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. She would flirt and joke and compete for the best marks. Then, she would be shocked when the boys would admit that they were in love with her. What? How did this happen? Maud would question in her journals. This went on well into her 20s. When, stuck on the farm with grandmother, she would use her flirt techniques to get rides by sleigh or wagon to revival meetings or socials. She wrote about Lou Distant or Lem McLeod and how she would talk to them about the moon, the ocean tide, standard pre-makeout talk. This would continue for the winter season, while Maud still needed a lift. And then by spring, when the winter driver finally got up enough courage to tell her how they felt, she would act incredulous. How could they possibly think she wanted more? Besides, it was spring. She could walk everywhere now. We're on to this game. Maud loved to muse about how some of the men never really got over her. We hope they did. We're talking to you, Lou Distant. We have his pictures in the show notes, and we've always had a soft spot for Lou. By this time, many girls her age were getting married and having babies. And although this would rarely be spoken aloud, they were having sex. Maud was plugging away at teaching and writing and making sure grandmother was being taken care of, and it was a lot for a young woman. And then eventually, in the summer of 1897, at the age of 23, Maud got a serious proposal. Now, he happened to be her second cousin. We know, but according to my grandma, that wasn't weird back then, so just try to forget it. We understand if you can't, but try. His name was Edwin Simpson, and she thought he was good looking. We think he looked a lot like her. We have a side-by-side -side picture in the show notes, so you can dare to compare. But looks aside, he was smart, did a lot of public speaking, and got a lot of attention in the community, just like Maud. Edwin checked all the boxes for her, but he also had a reputation in the community for being conceited and a know-it-all. She wrote about him in June 1897. When we reached home, he came in. As for me, I was suddenly in the clutches of an icy horror. I shrank from his embrace and kiss. I was literally terrified at the repulsion which quivered in every nerve of me at his touch. It 
seemed as if something that had been dormant in me all my life had suddenly woken and shook me with a passion of revolt against my shackles. But what to do? Of course we can see it. If you're engaged, though, and you write that entry, maybe you should run. But if you are overwhelmed and you're scared about your unsettled future, maybe it's not so obvious. So you say yes to the distraction. Maud accepted a teaching job across the island in Lower Bedeck. And what happened next? Or should we say, who happened next? Maybe now is the time to unbutton that bodice. Newly hired as the Lower Bedeck school marm, Maud was to board at the Leard Farm in 1897. Enter the eldest son, Herman Leard, who lived at home. And that came in handy later on. Maud didn't take much notice of him initially, but three weeks after, he was driving her home from a party, and she leaned her head over on his shoulder. I found Herman jolly and full of fun. I soon made up my mind concerning him, and I never changed it. He had no trace of intellect, culture, or education, no interest in anything beyond his farm and the circle of young people who composed the society he frequented. In plain, sober truth, he was only a very nice, attractive young animal. And yet... And yet is right, Maud. From that carriage ride onward, she pretty much lost all of her self-control, and we were so happy to read it. Good job, Maud. Someone you're into way to fight those expectations put on you by society, your family, and by the queen herself. Maud was lovesick. She couldn't sleep at night. She started leading what she called her double life as the girl of mirth and merriment by day when she taught and socialized, and then the sexual woman she was in his company. She would compare the yin-yang energy she described as her passionate Montgomery blood and her Puritan McNeil conscience. As adults, Herman's sisters remember Maud flitting about their living room, looking out the windows, waiting for Herman to return by 11 p.m. Where was he? This was mysterious. Where was Herman? Why wasn't he with her? But we quickly forgot these questions because we'd get swept up in her entries describing his late-night sexy sneaks into her room. He had major game when he brought her the mail. He would bring books, her favorite chocolate caramels. They made out on her chaise countless times. She does, however, mention that he was inconsistent. She told herself that he may have been feeling confused because he knew she was engaged to Edwin. Thankfully, though, this affair caused her to break it off with Edwin. Great move, Maud. He wasn't easy to dump. Edwin did not readily accept rejection. Maud really had to work to lose that second cousin, but she did it, and things with she and Herman kept ramping up. I felt Herman's burning breath on my face. His burning kisses on my lips. And then I heard him making the same request he had made before. Veiled half inaudible but unmistakable. For a moment that seemed like a year, my whole life reeled in the balance. The most horrible temptation swept over me. I remember to this minute its awful power to yield, to let him stay where he was, to be his body and soul for that one night at least. Whoa. She didn't go through with it, though. She wrote in her journal she didn't do it out of a fear of Herman's contempt, sure. But she also had the complex and repressed sexuality of the Victorian era that we've covered. We can understand. It must have been rough. She went back home after the news of the death of Grandfather. She had to go back to the farm and defend her turf against Uncle John and Cousin Prescott. They were the legal heirs to the land. But Maud fought so she and Grandmother could stay. How sad, how stressful, how alone she must have felt. She was finally free of Edwin, so why no Herman? The story was getting fuzzy for us. Maud wrote in her journals that Herman was not smart enough for her and he didn't have the high morals she had. His family wasn't good enough. My mom had always told me that Lucy Maud Montgomery married a crazy minister and should have married this farm boy she was really in love with, but he wasn't good enough for her. So that story lingered down generations and geography. And during the bleakness of her days on that farm came the terrible day when Maud found out that Herman died of influenza. It was bad. Grandmother read it to her from the local paper sitting at that table. Can you imagine? Maud was devastated. Combine Maud's true feelings for Herman, her overwhelming passion, and the romantic tragedy of his death. She really never let Herman go, and we couldn't really either. So again, why didn't they get together? Why didn't they have these last two years together? 
Jenny and I would ask each other these questions, and then one day Jenny found the answer. He was engaged to another woman. Oh, snap. That is where Herman was till 11 p.m. The truth behind why they couldn't really be together. Her name was Eddie Sherman, and she was a beloved, beautiful pillar of the community. We have her picture in the show notes. Maude totally knew this. It was a purposeful omission. Again, this is another example how Maud rewrote her story for future generations. Well done, Maud. You got us. For a while. Maud rewrote this section when she was in her 40s and purposefully painted the picture that she didn't choose him. But various biographies state otherwise. We'd also like to let you know that Herman Leard, although a cheater, was a highly respected member of Lower Bedeck, and he came from a loving and successful farm family. Herman's death rocked the community. His funeral was attended by hundreds of people. He wasn't beneath Maud. He had simply chosen someone else. And, squad, we have an historical romance update. In 2016, a woman named July Edgecombe bought the Leard family home to turn it into a bed and breakfast. As her husband was pulling up the ancient floorboards, they discovered a corset, a garter belt, a man's handkerchief, and what could be a woman's night jacket. And it turns out, the fashion is completely in line with the time when Maud boarded at Herman's. We're not saying that they were down to their knickers and Herman had to quickly stash the gear in the floorboards when they were almost busted, or that Maud could have made a little time capsule from a special moment. But maybe we love this discovery. Take a look in the show notes. Regardless, when that romance ended, she was home and time was ticking along. No Herman, no Edwin, no one. Just back on the farm, keeping that roof over Grandma's head and clunking out cereals on a typewriter that couldn't make a W. When the just lovely minister Ewan MacDonald was called to preach in Cavendish. This brings us to what we mentioned earlier. Maud's biggest eradication of her history. Her courtship with her husband, the Reverend Ewan MacDonald. That's where she razored out the journal entries. Maud was 29 when they first met. Ewan was nice looking, known for his gentle disposition and thoughtful connection to the community. What is so different from our modern society is the church back then was the focus of life in Canada. And as head of the church, Ewan was automatically a big deal. What a catch! Such a catch that Maud agreed to become the church organist. Cute move. This suggests that Maud at one point was genuinely interested. She wrote about him in June 1903 in a separate journal she co-created with her friend Nora that... My heart pity pattied so I could hardly play the hymns. It's weak yet, so I shall stop short. So there was definite affection there, but piecing together this part of Maud's life required serious detective work. Maud's biographer suggested that she hacked out the courtship section of her journals later in her life because they were so positive and loving and she couldn't relate to them anymore. The suggestion was that the entries hurt too much when she was stuck with a man whom she could no longer recognize. We hope the courtship was loving and fun. We hope there was pure joy for both of them then. Can you see it? You and coming up the lane, maybe with a bouquet of lupine, as grandmother sorted mail for the post, Maud resting her pen from Anne's spade work, just as Ewan knocked on the door. Isn't that sweet? Can't you see it? We can. And we want to hold on to it, but there is little proof. She journaled that she missed Ewan exceedingly when he was away in Scotland, and that Ewan affectionately called her monkey and puss. As you learn more about her mindset around what marriage should be, their relationship reads more like an idealized Victorian version of a pious romance. Also, this very long engagement dragged out. So did any mention of you, and good or bad, it can barely be found. As her son Stuart said, My mother wanted an escape, but she did not know that the ship she chose had a faulty boiler. So we wonder if the razored sections of Maud's journals were also peppered with doubt. And perhaps even suspicion about Ewan? Maybe it was hard to read later on. Hard to read that she had seen the writing on the wall and she didn't listen to her gut. Maybe she wanted to protect her sons and future generations from what she'd witnessed. We will never know. If we judge their entire courtship on his weak proposal, then we can guarantee that courtship was bone dry. He asked Ellen Montgomery, wordsmith, writer, romantic, to marry him with these words. Share my life. Be my wife. Maud said yes. But she wouldn't marry until her grandma died. And who knew when that would be? She would never relinquish her duty. So what were Ewan's reasons for agreeing to this? We know that long engagements were not uncommon back then, but couldn't they have married and have grandmother move in with them? Well, instead, Ewan went to Glasgow, Scotland to study, and he lived through a terrible mental breakdown. Maud wrote of receiving an eerie postcard with only her address on the back. No messages. Ewan failed at school. 
he left Scotland. He took some less than prestigious preaching positions away from Cavendish, and then he went even further away from his fiancée to Ontario. All this time, they weren't seeing each other much. This takes us to fall 1909. Still engaged to Ewan and supporting grandmother, Maud was now a celebrated authoress for Anne of Green Gables. All of this alongside a severe bout of depression. The pressure at home from her family and now the world was getting to be too much. Maud was down, even as she was reaching career success. All of this was swirling around her when Maud's second cousin Oliver sailed into Cavendish. Again, a second cousin we know. And again, we will remind you of what Jenny's Graham said. It wasn't a big deal back then. So, sparks flew between Maud and the debonair divorced Oliver. He was into Maud big time. He was looking for a new wife and found one in Maud. She was successful, charming, and best of all to him, a real island girl. They hung out in Lover's Lane. We never found an account of Ewan and Maud ever hanging out there. Let us know if we're wrong. Maud was completely turned on by Oliver. He hit all the Herman buttons. She was pretty messed up about it. She wrote more in September 1909. I was again playing with fire. He is one of those men who have the power to kindle in me devastating flames of the senses. I thrilled from head to foot from his voice and physical nearness. The very repression of such intense feeling made it burn more fiercely. There is something in me that is crying out for him with a hideous desire and longing. Maud, would she go for it? Oliver offered her freedom within the confines of marriage. He suggested she could marry him, and if she didn't like it after a year, she could leave. He said she could live wherever she wanted for nine months of the year, and she would have all the independence she desired. Maud was a Scorpio, so this girl was on fire. But that old Victorian mindset stepped in. And on September 21st, 1909, she journaled, I have a horror of feeling thus toward any man I cannot marry. It seems to me a shameful degrading, dangerous thing. And it is. Or you could just marry him, Maud. But Maud sent Oliver packing. Grandmother passed away just after Maud's tryst with Oliver. Maud was at her side. After loyally tending to her for years like a warrior, she was truly the best, but now it was time for Maud to face the music. She and Ewan were to be married. She left her home of 36 years and moved briefly to Park Corner, her cousin Fred's home, until she got married. She let herself get swept up in the pageantry of the wedding. The cakes, the presents. She modeled her honeymoon clothes, Vogue style. Check it out in the show notes. They are amazing. An interesting note is that she is not photographed in her wedding dress. Everything else but the actual wedding gown. And all of this seemed to cover up what was actually going to happen. She was going to marry Ewan. She described her wedding reception in her journals in June 1911. I tried to choke down a few mouthfuls. I could not. And now, when it was all over, and I found myself sitting there by my husband's side, oh, my husband, I felt a sudden horrible inrush of rebellion and despair. I wanted to be free. At that moment, if I could have torn the wedding ring off my finger and so freed myself, I would have done it. I sat at that gay bridal feast in my white veil and orange blossoms beside the man I had married, and I was as unhappy as I had ever been in my life. Maud also wrote in her journal about leaving the wedding reception with Ewan, their car followed by a hearse. Maud and Ewan were stuck in the middle of a funeral procession. Maud joked about this but never forgot it. Ominous. Well, at least she could look forward to her fully self-funded honeymoon. And finally, Maud had sex. Juicy, right? Well, what will it say in the journals? What happened? Despite that her stuff, would the longest engagement finally pay off? At this point, the journals turn into a travel diary of England and mostly Scotland. What? Scotland? Why would they go to Scotland? Well, Maud wanted to visit the home of her ancestors and beloved authors and to visit her pen pal, the handsome Scottish journalist George Macmillan, whom Ewan had met during his stint in Glasgow. They could tour historical monuments of literary heroes. Not exactly Ewan's thing. Plus, don't forget what happened for him in Scotland earlier. This could not have been fun for him. The honeymoon pictures are telling. 
It seems like Maud and George cavorted around the moors exchanging witticisms while George's much younger, beautiful fiancé sulked alone, and Ewan retreated to the rear of the pack. The pictures are in the show notes. Maud mentions their honeymooning sparingly. There is much more made of Mary Queen of Scots Cradle. But don't despair. We scored some hard evidence that Maud did have sex during her Highland fling. In her journals, Maud complains of honeymoon cystitis. We were intrigued. What is this? It's Victorian speak for a bladder infection, which is often caused by sexual activity. Maud, we hope it was fun. And we hope that they have cranberry juice in Scotland. At this point in her journals, Maud's connection to anything sexy goes under the bushel until 1919. She became a supportive minister's wife, mother, and author. She mentions buying a book about sex education for her sons later, but she doesn't really mention how or if the lessons were taught. There was a telling story from Maud's daughter-in-law, Luella Reed. Maud suggested Luella change behind a screen in her bedroom to keep that marriage magic alive. She explained that she had done this for years with Ewan. Hmm. It wasn't good for a husband to see a wife naked. Who was this woman? Such a difference to the younger Maud who was mooning over Herman. Through marriage to Ewan, Maud seemed to have lost her connection to her sexuality. Until the day Ewan's old colleague and friend popped by to cheer him up. Captain Edwin Smith was a World War I British naval officer, a minister, a lecturer, a writer, an editor, a film producer, and an insurance salesman. He may have been Maud's deepest spiritual connection with a man, or maybe, as Maud's maid from that time, Lily Myers, gossiped later, he was her boyfriend. He was also married with seven kids, so who was this Renaissance man? Well, Captain Smith hailed from PEI, and during the time she was writing Anna Green Gables, he was a lauded public speaker and promoter of tourism for PEI. Ewan and Maud both knew him on the island. His adventures had finally brought him to Ontario with his wife and those seven kids, and when he was selling insurance, but he was still subbing in as a minister. He arrived back in their lives in a significant way in September 1919. For four years, he would come by and help cover for Ewan when Ewan wasn't well. And the parish loved it when he would come, as he was a famous war hero and he had produced the British historical war film, The Empire Shield, as Maud wrote in February 1922. Captain Smith is one of the few people I have met with whom I can discuss with absolute frankness any and every subject, even the delicate ones of sex. Sex is to men and women one of the most vital subjects in the world, perhaps the most vital subject since our total existence is based on and centers around it. Yet with how few, even of women, can this vital subject be frankly and intelligently discussed? It's so overlaid with conventions, inhibitions, and taboos that it's almost impossible for anyone to see it as it really is. Lily the maid was hired in 1917, and by the time Smith swept in, she was way over being a domestic. Maud said she was bitter, and maybe she didn't understand that a man and a woman could be friends, but there are other interesting points that make us think. Where there was smoke, was there fire? The families would travel together, but then there were also car rides with just Maud and Smith alone, as they would have speaking engagements in the same towns. Or Smith would stay over when Ewan was away, but none of this is proof that anything funny was happening. But then came the serial publication of Maud's slightly steamy novel, The Blue Castle. Forget Brangelina, Maud Squad. We have our own favorite power couple, Balancy. Maud messed up. The leading man's name was Snaith, and it had popped up in a serialization as Smith, like Edwin Smith. When I first read that, I thought, big deal, who cares? I make typing mistakes all the time. But the typeset had been made from Maud's own handwriting. She had made the mistake herself. Was Edwin the prototype for Barney? The town did talk. And it's not just us. Dr. Rubio posits that the inspiration for Snaith was Smith. And with that published typo, it could have caused Maud to go back and erase most of his presence from her journals. Remember Maud's motto, what will people think? Given the years that those two spent together, their shared background and history, it's odd that Smith is only mentioned 14 times. One could, at first review, consider him inconsequential. The last mention of his name in her journals came with what may have been a tactical move by Maud. She invited Smith and his wife to town the last time he preached. This would show a gossiping community that it was all just talk. And it may have been. We didn't really know what to make of it until the day Jenny and I discovered that Maud gave her treasured typewriter, the one she clunked away at to bring us Anna Green Gables to him, 
to Edwin Smith, sea captain, reverend, and maybe the closest male companion she ever had. To us, actions speak louder than these heavily edited words in the journals. She must have missed him terribly. You can imagine how grim and lonely things must have been for Maud after that journal entry. Captain Smith was gone. She had rewritten the Herman Leard part of her journal, alone in her room, who knows how many times, and Ewan's mental illness was escalating. Professionally, her popularity was also dwindling, as she was downgraded to youth writer. It was 1926, and she was not in a good place, despite the throngs of fan mail. But one fan's letter did catch her eye. It was from Isabel Anderson. Because of the childish vocabulary of the letter, Maud initially thought Isabel was a little girl. She was shocked when she met her. Isabel a 30-something-year-old schoolteacher. Despite this initial confusion, Maud and Isabel's relationship escalated over the years, and this always confused us. Why did Maud let it go on so long, unless she was interested, and we mean sexually, in Isabel? Small gifts were exchanged, Isabel begged for kisses, and Maud documented two sleepovers. According to the journals, Isabel proclaimed her love for Maud, and in turn, Maud would rant about Isabel. To us, these entries from Maud, they read as mean and confusing. Why keep hanging out with her? We really had scratched over this relationship more than any other, especially when we made that discovery at the University of Guelph Library that we promised to share with you. I was drawn towards Maud's beloved Agatha Christie novels. While I flipped through one, two cards floated out from the pages, and they were Valentine's. Score, we were filled with excitement as we cracked them open. Who could they be from? Herman? Edwin? Little Stuart, maybe? We opened them slowly, like we were in a movie. And who were they from? Isabel. We kid you not, Mod Squad, we have a photo in the show notes. We tucked them back between the pages, but it made us question all of this even more. Why did she keep valentines from Isabel? Was it love? I would be talking about Maud, as I do, and people would say, hey, Ella Montgomery was gay, right? I would think of Herman and Oliver and say, nope, that lady likes dudes. And I always wondered where this rumbling came from until one day I heard Dr. Waterston being interviewed on CBC's Was Anne Shirley a Lesbian? I'm, I'm not going to argue about the Eleanor Roosevelt case, okay. which is a very different one, yes. because um, Montgomery, as a young person, was involved in a series of highly charged heterosexual romances. Mm -hmm. She had the one does luck not in her husband. But the one does not preclude the other, by the no, way. No, no. Oh, yeah. no. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think that Montgomery was interested in all sorts of ranges of, of emotions, but in, this, and in her journal, she certainly uh, explores and is interested in lesbianism. It isn't that she wasn't unaware of it. She is. Mm -hmm. She was. She was, yes especially late, much later in her life. But Anne of Green Gables was written, you know, when she was a youngish woman, not engaged, not married, but remembering her own childhood. And uh, to me, the memory of childhood is, is perfectly valid as I read it, although everybody else is welcome to read it any way they like. When Professor Laura Robinson wrote Bosom Friends, Lesbian Desire in Ellen Montgomery's Anne books, she opened a can of currant wine. The Canadian media oddly went bananas. Dr. Robinson's paper stated that although Anne married a man, her true love was Diana, with leaning towards Hold the Phone, Catherine Brooke, and Leslie Moore. All right, let's unpack this. To us, we see the Anne and Diana relationship as Victorian romanticized female friendship at its best. Domesticity and women's roles were idealized, and the heteronormative gaze was the only gaze. So Anne and Di were just expressing themselves, but we get how their relationship could come across like a lesbian relationship to a modern audience. Anne being sad that Diana would leave her for a husband, the two of them promising lifelong friendship to one another, we get it. The media storm, however, was in full force, and so were the rebuttals. The Toronto, Canada LGBTQ plus community produced an amazing cabaret called Anne Made Me Gay. I saw it at Buddies in Bad Time, and I have to give it five stars. I still think about those aerial acts. So we are with Dr. Waterston on that CBC interview. Anne can be seen from many points of view. Anne with an E on CBC Netflix is a perfect example, and that's what makes Anne of Green Gables such an enduring text. What we are learning the more we dig is that Anne and Maud can be seen through all lenses, and we say it's about time. We don't believe that Maud identified as LGBTQ+, even privately. Instead, we believe that lonesome Maud felt trapped in her relationship with Isabel. What Maud hadn't known, at least initially, was that Isabel had a history of stalking men and women in her hometown of Acton, Ontario. Isabel had threatened Maud with death by suicide, and Maud could easily have feared that she was going to get tangled up in the aftermath. 
Although we initially believed that the modern Isabel story was a potential romance, we don't believe it was love. To us, Isabel's sexuality and Maud's attraction, or lack thereof, was not really the point anyways. The story here was that Maud was once again confronted by a person who was dealing with mental illness. This, as we are about to tackle in episode 4, would haunt Maud her entire adult life. So, tune into our next episode where we leave the world of sex and sexuality and explore the complicated minds of Maud and her family. Don't worry, we won't let you sink into the depths of despair. There is light. If anyone knew the power of humor and hope, it was Maud. And she kept us laughing even in her dark times. Thanks for listening, Mod Squad, and tune in next week for episode four. I felt like that fly. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. See you next time. Ellen Montgomery's journal entries are read by Nola Augustson. If you enjoyed today's episode, please consider giving us a rating or a review. It goes a long way in helping us find a new audience for Maud.